Hello, I'm Steve Nissen, uh, Chief Academic Officer of the Heart and Vascular Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. And it's my pleasure today to talk to you about the role of lipoprotein A in coronary disease. This is an important emerging novel target. My disclosures are shown here. Uh, please note at the bottom that while I do work with the pharmaceutical industry, I do not accept honoraria, speaking fees, or any consulting fees or any other form of income so that I can remain independent. Well, the New York Times wrote about uh, lipoprotein little a, and they called it the heart risk factor even doctors know little about. And I agree with this. Uh, I have been uh, giving a lecture like this around the country at some very major medical centers. If I ask for people to have a show of hands of who routinely measures lipoprotein little a, only a few hands go up in the audience. This will need to change. So what exactly is lipoprotein A? Well, it's an LDL-like particle consisting of ApoB covalently bonded to ApoA. Remember, ApoA has got these Kringle domains via disulfide bond. We think it likely evolved from the plasminogen gene, the proenzyme converted to the fibrinolytic enzyme plasmin by activators such as TPA. LPA has some similarities to LDL, but it is more atherogenic, promoting both inflammation and thrombosis. And it has mice, many isoforms, more than 40, based on Kringle 4 repeats, with all isoforms contributing to some extent to atherogenic risk. So here's the structure. On the left, you see uh, a particle with four Kringle 4 type 2 repeats. And on the right, you see 40 Kringle 4 repeats. Uh, the core particle is the same, oxidized phospholipid and ApoB, but this uh, ApoA component is variable. And as I will show you, that has a lot to do with the blood levels of LP little a. So what are abnormal or risky levels? Well, the cut points that are typically used are anywhere from 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter, or if you're somewhere where the measurement is made in nanomoles, anywhere from 100 to 165 nanomoles per liter. The fact that there are two different unit systems has created a lot of difficulty and confusion in ed educating physicians about how to interpret these blood levels. So this is the distribution from the Copenhagen City Heart Study, Borge Nordeskard, who is just a tremendous colleague in this field, um, showing that about 20% of men and women have levels above approximately 50 milligrams per deciliter. Most of us are in the blue, but some of us are in the gold territory. And if you're in the gold territory, you have increased risk. And when you get up toward the tail of this uh, area, you're starting to talk about really big risks, as I will show you. So this is from the Dallas Heart Study, men and women. Uh, and you see that race makes a difference. Uh, these are mostly African-Americans. So the black population in the US has levels substantially higher more than twofold higher than white or Hispanic patients. And that, uh, in fact, if you look at the 90% confidence limits, in nanomoles per liter, they range up to about 200 nanomoles in uh, black patients. Now, why do we think that this is such an important uh, marker for disease and why it's in such an important target for treatment? If you use a cut point of 60 milligrams per deciliter, there are 64 million people that have this abnormality in the US, 150 million in the European Union, and 1.4 billion people uh, globally. If you take the top 10%, there are still 700 million globally and 75 million in Europe. And so this is not an uncommon variant and it is a major driver of cardiovascular risk. So what is the relationship between lipoprotein A level and adverse cardiovascular outcomes? 
Well, here we see from the Copenhagen City Heart Study, classical information. If you're above 117 milligrams per deciliter, you've got nearly a three-fold increase in cardiovascular risk. Even if you're in that 77 to 117 category, you have a two-fold increase risk. And, and those people that are really below the threshold that we consider risky, that is in the 30 to 76 milligram per deciliter range, they still have a you know more than a one and a half fold increased risk. What you really want to have is an LPA level of less than five, which is the referent group here. Now you see that on the left that there is this uh, increase that is not monotonic. It is actually curvilinear. It's exponential. That L as LPA rises, this is from 9,300 cases from the Emerging Risk Factor Collaboration. The references are at the bottom of all of these slides. Not much is going on until you get to a level of about 24. But when you get up to 48 milligrams per deciliter, risk is going up. When you get to uh, you know, higher levels in the range of 90 to 100, risk becomes quite high. And we see patients, I have patients, whose levels are 400 milligrams per deciliter, and they're at extraordinary risk. Same thing's true for ischemic stroke. This exponential rise in risk as levels rise. Non-vascular death, no effect. This is purely a marker for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and its complications. Now, unfortunately, none of us are immune. If you look at gender and age and body mass index and HDL level and triglycerides, there is a, a not a statistically significant p-value for interaction. In other words, none of these factors have anything to do with risk. It is purely a matter of the elevated lipoprotein A that drives risk. So the question is, how does this lipoprotein contribute to atherosclerosis? What are the mechanisms here? And one of the reasons this is such a noxious uh, driver of disease is that it has two mechanisms of harm. You see on the left side of this screen the core particle, which looks a lot like LDLC. It has ApoB, has oxidized phospholipid, and it does all of the things that LDL does. Foam cell formation, smooth muscle cell proliferation, monocyte attraction. Then you see the disulfide bond, and on the right you see the APOA component. And this is a prothrombotic mechanism. So the APOA component uh, decreases plasminogen activation, it increases platelet response, it does all of the things that a prothrombotic um, lipoprotein like this will do. And so we talk about atherothrombotic disease. Well here rolled into a single particle is the atherosclerotic component and the thrombotic component and it's driving atherothrombotic disease. Now these levels are genetically determined. Diet and lifestyle have absolutely no effect. Here you see uh, the genetics. Uh, there are a number of SNPs that have been identified that are associated with elevated lipoprotein A. The most common of them is the second one, RS1045-5872. It's present in about 7% of the population and it confers a 70% increased risk of atherosclerotic vascular disease, in this case coronary disease. Uh, less common variants, the one at the top, is even a little bit worse. And there are all kinds of variants here that have varying degrees of risk. So genetics are the major driver. It's your genes, not what you eat, not how much you exercise, that determine your risk. Now it turns out that both alleles contribute to the lipoprotein A level. On the right, 
you see an allele that codes for a apolipoprotein A with many Kringle 4 repeats, in this case, 34. And it's contributing, as shown in blue, to just a little bit of the lipoprotein A level. On the left, you see a, an allele that contributes a fewer number of Kringle 4 repeats. And in orange, it's contributing a great deal to the lipoprotein A level. If you combine the effects of both alleles, that determines the level. In this case, it's up around 70 milligrams per deciliter, which is a level where you start to see a lot of harm. And as we mentioned, you have this duality of harm. You have the, the things that LDL cholesterol does, uh, and you have the things that apolipoprotein uh, d d does, and they're a combination of proatherogenic effects shown on the left and prothrombotic effects shown on the right. And we think that the, a lot of this is due to this homology between plasminogen and ApoA. And so uh, this is probably the common link, and we actually do think that the ApoA lipoprotein gene evolved from plas the plasminogen gene. Now, given that fact, given this prothrombotic effect, you'd expect clotting in other locales, and that's exactly what you see. Here's LPA and venous thrombosis risk. This is a meta-analysis published many years ago, but it's well done. If you have abnormality, in this case, only 30 milligrams per deciliter elevation, you have a 77% increased risk of venous thromboembolism. And so that plasminogen-like component is driving thrombosis as well as atherosclerosis. And it is also a powerful risk factor for aortic stenosis. Here you see that at a level greater than 95 milligrams per deciliter, no, I'm sorry, greater than 124 milligrams per deciliter, that's the 95th percentile, you have a threefold increased risk of aortic stenosis, lifetime risk. Levels of around uh, uh, 80 confer a twofold increased risk, and even levels in the 60, in the 40 milligrams per deciliter range confer about a 50% increased risk of aortic stenosis. Powerful risk factor for aortic stenosis. Not only are you at greater risk for aortic stenosis, you're at greater risk for progression. If you find a patient with mild to moderate AS who has an elevated lipoprotein A, watch out. Because in fact, they have about a 50% higher risk of progression of the peak velocity across the aortic valve. Highly reproducible, been shown by multiple studies, and uh, it's something we really need to watch out for. And this is really quite extraordinary data. If you're in the first and second tertile for lipoprotein A, this is your survival rate uh, without aortic valve replacement. In tertile three, you see this within five years, a very substantial number of patients, maybe as many as 40%, have either died or progressed to aortic valve replacement. Hazard ratio here is 2.0. Again, very powerful risk factor. Well, what about statins? You know, we live in the world where statins, you know, a lot of people want to put them in the water supply, and certainly many cardiologists I know uh, take a statin. What do they do for lipoprotein little a levels? And in fact, there's a meta-analysis of all the statin trials that shows consistent effects. If you sum up all the studies for all of the statins, you see about an average of 11% in, 
increase in uh, LPA levels. Now, it's probably not enough to make much of a difference, but it, it's an interesting and not entirely explainable phenomenon. Now, what about current treatments? Well, lifestyle doesn't do anything. Uh, statins to lower LDL are reasonable. Estrogen does seem to lower LPA, but this has not been well, well studied. Niacin does lower LPA, but as you know, its effects on reducing events is unknown and the drug has real downsides. PCSK9 inhibitors modestly lower LP little a, but not enough to really make a difference. And you can get big reductions with apheresis. There is data from a single study, the Women's Health Initiative, that reports a, uh, that these patients ha with a confirmed SNP for an elevated lipoprotein A had a very substantial increase in risk and that their risk was dramatically reduced with aspirin. It makes sense given the prothrombotic propensity of lipoprotein A. However, it is unconfirmed. In general, most of us will say treat with aspirin until proven otherwise. Now, apheresis, and there have been several articles, I'm gonna show you one study has been used uh, keep in mind that it lowers LDL and a LP little a. This is a group of people with an LP little a of 105 milligrams per deciliter who received apheresis and got a good reduction, you know, time average reduction in both LDLC and LPA. And now this is this study uses historical controls, not very good scientifically. And what you see, however, is in the two years pre apheresis lots of MIs, lots of PCIs, and lots of cabbages. In the two years after apheresis, very few or much fewer events. It suggests that maybe this strategy works. It's done more in Europe than in the US. I'm not sure how much it's done in the UK, uh, but it is available. The real question is, can we pharmacologically address LP little a. I have been wanting to address this, L, this abnormality for the last 30 years. And that opportunity is finally presenting itself. But the real uh, action is in turning off this gene. Uh, the term that's used is gene silencing. And for those of you that don't think about this every day, uh, there are really several ways to do it. I'm gonna talk about the first two. Uh, you can have a, uh, a, a DNA strand that's single-stranded, that's complementary to messenger RNA for lipoprotein A, and you can administer it, and it will bind up the messenger RNA and, and basically prevent the gene product, in this case, APO, lipoprotein A from being produced. A second approach is a short interfering RNA. Uh, that's a double-stranded approach uh, uh, where the same basic principle applies. You're trying to bind up and or, and or degrade the messenger RNA to prevent this lipoprotein A protein from being formed. And here's how the antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO, works. You have the gene, you give the single-stranded DNA, it binds the messenger RNA, and then there are endogenous RNA aces that degrade the complex, and no APOA is produced. It's really very simple, but getting it to work is not so simple, but it's, we've really gotten there. So, this is an ASO, an antisense oligonucleotide, originally developed by a company known as Isis Pharmaceuticals in San Diego, California. They decided to change their name from Isis Pharmaceuticals. I don't know why they decided to change it, but they changed it to Ionis Pharmaceuticals. The phase one trial published in The Lancet, and you see that big doses, in this case, 300 milligrams produced a pretty good reduction, about 
in lipoprotein A levels, uh, but you had to give the drug fairly frequently and you had to give a lot of drug to get these levels of reduction. And remember, this has got to be given, you know, parenterally. So it's, you know, there are some real issues about drug delivery. You see a dose-dependent re dose, uh, response here. Now, in order to do this, you got to get the drug into the liver because that's the target organ. And so you can give a lot of antisense oligonucleotide and some of it will get into the hepatocytes and enough of it gets into the hepatocytes when you give a lot of it and you give it frequently to block the APOA production in the hepatocyte in the liver. But then there was a breakthrough. And this breakthrough uh, allows for contemporary approaches. There's a sugar and acetylgalactosamine or GALNAC that's a highly efficient ligand for an hepatic receptor. And GALNAC, which is derived from galactose, is well characterized and it's cleaved and cleared rapidly once it gets into the liver. Uh, and so the enhanced compound has a GALNAC moiety attached to the antisensoglonucleotide. And it becomes much more efficient at getting into the hepatocyte and roughly 30 times more potent and longer lasting as well. And so you can lower the dose by about tenfold and it improves tolerability as well. And here you can see that this, you know, almost two log improvement, uh, you know, shift to the left in the uh, dose response uh, curves for the GALNAC enhanced antisense oligonucleotide, much more potent. And so a second study published approximately a year later now shows instead of 300 milligrams, the top dose here is 40 milligrams. The knockdown is as much as 90% and the effect is much more durable. It takes a while to wash out. And so you can give a much smaller amount of drug and you can get a much bigger effect when you combine the small DNA fragment with GALNAC to get it into the hepatocyte. So this was studied very carefully in phase two. And I know many of you have read this manuscript. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, really remarkable. Uh, 286 patients. The top dose was 20 milligrams a week. Got an 80% reduction in lipoprotein A levels. If your level starts at 100, you go to 20. If it starts at 200, you go to about 40. It just takes this risk factor off of the table. Does have to be given by injection, but as I will show you, uh, 20 milligrams a week is actually equivalent in effect to 80 milligrams given monthly. So a once a month injection, 80% reduction in levels and enormous reduction in risk, we hope. So we have a trial, uh, I'm the study chair. Uh, it's being run out of the Cleveland Clinic in collaboration, close collaboration with Novartis, who's our sponsor and uh, been just a delight to work with. Uh, at 1,000 sites in 48 countries, it's approximately 8,000 patients with established coronary disease in two strata. One strata is LP little a above 70 milligrams per deciliter, and the other is above 90 milligrams per deciliter. The patients are optimized on background therapies, and they're randomized to this drug, which is now called Pelicarsin, 80 milligrams monthly or placebo for four years. Our primary endpoint is four component MACE, that's CV death, non-fatal MI, stroke or hospitalization for urgent coronary revascularization. But we have a problem. We have to find these patients. And this trial we think has enormous public health implications. We gotta find the patients. And we have a world where 
most practitioners are not looking for lipoprotein A. Somebody comes in with a myocardial infarction who's 45 years old, you need to get an LPA level because it may be 150. And they would then become eligible for the trial with a thousand sites around the world, wherever you are, you probably can find a place that can uh, enroll the patient. Uh, I think we're entering an era for this disorder that is really extraordinary. I think we will have an enormous public health impact if we can find these patients and get them enrolled. We're now about 70% enrolled in this trial. We're coming along very nicely. And we will, in a few years, get the answer. And I hope it's like LDL cholesterol in the statins. I hope when we take LP little a levels down by 80% that we'll see the benefits that we hope. Thank you very much for your attention. Really a pleasure to join you.